For Professor Wei, uh, he's a specialist for um, nanofossils. And later, we'll see, we'll introduce a little bit of his work. But before that, let's look at how we retrieve these sediments. So first, we need a big research ship with a really solid towers. This is equivalent to the ice core tower. You uh, carry lots of dri drill pits to, um, and with a very high technique anchoring, then uh, to drop down the drill pits to penetrate the sea floors. And if you stand right underneath the towers, it looks like this. And the trio pits will, uh, would be hanging here. And this is a drill pit. It actually looks like um, our teeth or the teeth of the elephants. It has lots of nodules on top. Otherwise, it can, uh, when, it, when it rotates, um, it gives you the torch to penetrate the sediments. And here is the photo on the sea floors. Um, this is the drill pit, and this is the anchoring device. The reason they needed this is because um, the drill pit has limited length. So when you drill a segment, you need to retrieve it. But we want continuous records, so you need something to uh, guide you to go back to the original position. So this is a device to help you to go back to exactly the same hole and drill the second segment, the third segment. And after the drill pits raised up, all the uh, crews there try to pull out the sediments inside. And what they do is they cut it into half immediately. One half just safe in the storage uh, as archive, and the other half scientists on the cruise begin to work on that immediately. Here let me show, uh, introduce you Professor Wei's work a little bit. And here it, uh, the translation is um, little microfossils record uh, the big scale climate change. And what do we mean by little microfossils are this. We call that foraminiferous. For this bar, it's a scale bar. It's about uh, 200 microns. One micron equals to 10 to the minus 9. So uh, this is really tiny, probably equivalent to the size of uh, a grain of dust. However, uh, those planktonic for miniferous uh, are the, I should say, uh, the major frameworks for paleoceanography because all the chronologies and the basic climate change time frames comes from these studies. And how do we study that? But let me just show you the size of that. So for these photos, um, all of them are for a miniferous, and this is a coin. And this is a needle, and in the middle is uh, one specimen of for miniferous. So it's really tiny, but you can still see it with uh, naked eyes. And here, our student at NTU used stereo microscope to observe uh, those for miniferous. The way we do it is you need a really, really tiny brush and just um, just use a little bit of water and then you can you touch the foraminifera, then you can pick it up with water. And how to drop it down? You just do something like this, then it drops down. But remember, when you walk with them, you cannot sneeze or cough because you'll blow away all of your samples. And when I was a uh, sophomore, I think, I started uh, working in Professor Wei's lab. 
At that time, my major job is to wash the sediments and to pick up for mirrors for several hours per day on the microscope. And I never sneeze in front of those microfossils. So Professor Wei was pretty satisfied with my work at the time. <laughs> After we pick up those forums, what do we want? What, why do we want them? Actually, uh, we are going to do a destructive experiment. We, we dissolve them and to measure um, their chemical compositions in those machines. Sometimes we measure the magnesium calcium ratios in the crust because these ratios correlate to temperature. And sometimes we measure the oxygen isotopes of these skeletons because it tells us uh, when the ice age happens. Um, let me let me show you the curve of glacial and interglacial changes. Um, usually, our goal is to study glacial interglacial variation, and I feel there is a need to define these terminologies before we go forward. So. Um, in geological time scale, we usually call call very cold period. We just call that glacial period. And warm period, we call it interglacial. Like now, it's interglacial period. And for glacial and interglacial, at least for the late Pleistocene, uh, it alternates in the cycle of about um, 100,000 years. Every 100,000 years, it switch to another phase. And in paleoceanography, we talk about LGM a lot. LGM means last glacial maximum. It means the extremely cold um, time during last glacier. Usually, it's about um, 18,000 years ago or 20,000 years ago. And later, we'll show you lots of reconstruction at LGM. Then, if we talk about shorter uh, climate change, we usually focus on Holocene, which is uh, 10,000 years ago, from 10,000 years ago to now. So we are in Holocene. And within the Holocene, although it is an interglacial warm period, we still have some relatively warmer and colder period. And this kind of research um, are really common in Europe. We call them medieval warm period and little ice age. In the beginning, scientists think this is a global event. MWP is earlier than LIA. But then gradually, uh, based on coral studies and deep sea sediment studies, we gradually realized actually those things did not happen at the same time on Earth. So not many people use this to correlate anymore. But still, we'll notice in early Holocene, in everywhere on Earth, we always have a somewhat warm period and followed by a somewhat colder period. And later, we'll see that in uh, Professor Wei's uh, figure. And let me just ask that how many of you have tried to log in the course website of NTU? Okay, so um, for these slides, uh, we have posted that online, although not the complete version, but uh, if you want some reference, you can download it from that course website. And now, let me tell you why I want to introduce you the terminologies. In these figures, white areas means glacial cold time. Yellow areas means interglacial warm time. The reason we want for raminiferous oxygen isotopes is because its variation can tell us warm and cold period. In this plus, x-axis again represent the age from now to 300,000 years before present 
and those uh, let's just look at the blue dot and the blue curve as for now those curves were oxygen isotope data from foraminifer retrieved from deep sea cores and um, when oxygen isotope is more negative the global climate uh, was warmer so uh, and we call the warmer period uh, we're using I should say we're using odd numbers to call warmer period so we call this stage 3 stage 5 stage 7 and now it's stage 1 here are warm period and that's why um, when we talk about glacier interglacier it's not just last glacier in the past there are lots of cycles between them and now I want to uh, introduce you uh, more about the local research around Taiwan these are three cores from Professor Wei's lab in the east of Taiwan and I think originally he wanted to know the variation of crucials in the past that's why they uh, select those locations so let's look at this course 7a first in this plot x-axis uh, is also age but is this is year 2000 is right now here and this is uh, year 800 and for this green uh, spot are um, sea surface temperature reconstructed based on planktonic foraminiferous so Professor Wei has identified that we also have a warm period in the early part of Holocene and followed by uh, a relative cold period but the timing seemed to be very different from Europe but anyway this is uh, uh, past temperature variation around Taiwan then let's look at the second core 9D this one and this core um, we only have the records for the past 400 years from year 1700 to year about year 2000 and we'll see that around 18th century the temperature seems to be uh, much higher and I guess you guys can notice there seem to be always a gap here the reason is because um, we always have sediments on top of the sea floor but when we use a uh, machine to retrieve the cores we always somehow lose the top part so uh, it's extremely difficult to study climate change uh, for the recent times from deep sea sediment because this is inevitably we, we lose it and the only method we can understand uh, such recent climate is from coral studies or from ice core studies and now let's look at uh, the last core from Professor Guo Yan Wei's lab it's around uh, Lü Dao, this one for this plot again the x-axis is um, current age I should say modern time right now here and to the past 8,000 years before present and it looks like the temperature does not vary um, more than 2 uh, degrees Celsius but sometimes we have uh, like dramatic change in the past now let me introduce you uh, although the figure is a little bit blurry but I'll just try to explain it in details this is a, um, a figure to show you that we actually have lots of cores from lake sediments in Taiwan and there was a collaborating program called APAC Asian Paleo Environmental Changes programs to try to understand 
uh, the quaternary continental climate changes in Asia. In the first phase, they drill lots of lake sediments from mainland China. And in the second phase, they focus on, ta uh, on Taiwan lakes. And um, for lake sediments, uh, the most difficult part would be uh, to determine the age. Because um, usually, lake sediments cannot be as long as the ocean sediment cores. So the only method to determine the age is carbon-14 dating. Um, but you need to have carbon in your material to be dated. So either you find a piece of leaf in the sediments, or a piece of wood, or some organic matters in the sediments. Otherwise, there's no available material for you to determine the age. So for lake sediments, usually um, if they are lucky enough to have layers, you can have a relative time scale. But for absolute time scale, uh, it's not that easy to establish. So let's say uh, we are lucky enough to establish the chronology. Then what kind of information and what kind of material we can use? Let me just show you these photos. The most common materials from lake sediments are pollens and spores. And these are uh, photos under microscopes of uh, common pollens and spores. And let's say, um, let's look at one, two, six, seven. If you see these kind of pollens, it means um, this place is warm to temperate rooms. And if you see uh, three, four, five, these kind of pollens, it means it's sub subtropical areas. And if you see 11, 12, 13, it means uh, the surroundings is pretty dry. And if you see, um, like, oh, here are some really useful ones. If you see 16, 17, 18, 19, this means uh, at that time, the weather is really wet. Supposedly, it should be a warm, humid area. And w um, why are these so important? Because um, you can actually find lots of pollens and spores from the lake sediments. And the way they do it is you try to count each individual type spores on the microscope, um, at least 400 of them. And then you can build up a statistics, the relative proportion of each spores or each pollens. We call this pollen assemblage. Then, of course, from modern environment, we know what kind of environments we have, what kind of plants, and their corresponding spores. Then you can know from the fossil assemblage, uh, compared to current plants, to know, um, to speculate the paleoclimate at the time. And actually, this is a very important um, work at least for Taiwanese lake sediment. And we have um, several scientists in National Taiwan University specialized in this kind of studies. But let me just mention that to you, this is also labor intensive work because you need to count and identify each species on the microscope. And for each layer of sediment, at least, 400 gram of that. So it takes years to do this kind of job, but it's useful and it could be the only uh, available information. And this is one of the results from the Poland studies from Professor Liu. And let me just explain that for you. Um, this diaphragm just a really simplified uh, version of a mountain. And this tells you the elevation, 800 meter altitudes up to about 3,000 meter high. And here we also marked the temperature. It means, uh, let's look at this. It means at the elevation about 2,000 meters, 
Uh, the air temperature is usually between 11 to 14 degrees Celsius. So if you see these slides online, you can kind of um, educate yourself that anything above 3,000 meters, the temperature would not be higher than 8 degrees Celsius. And let's look at these two uh, Chinese words. It means some uh, spruce. Let me see. I think it's some cypress and spruce. Sorry, I don't remember the English name, but let me just check my note. Oh, sorry, that's the hemlock and corcus tree. And for the mountain on the left-hand side, that's today's condition. It means today, this kind of trees grows uh, around 2,500 meter altitudes, but in during glacier times, it's about uh, 60 to 70 thousand years before present. They can find uh, the, the spores of those trees at about 800 meter altitudes, which means at that time, um, the air temperature was much, much colder at 800 meter altitude. So from those pollen studies, we know, um, we, are, we, we are so sure that at least at 60,000 years before present, it was really, really cold in Taiwan. So it means um, for those trees, they have shifted almost more than uh, 1,500 meters higher just because of the temperature change. And now, let me, um, oh, it's 11.20. Let me introduce, quickly introduce you a DVD uh, published last year. And this is Tropical Glaciers in Taiwan. Um, Professor Wei recommend you guys to view these DVDs if you are interested in local studies um, of climate. And I think they are available at Multimedia Center and uh, the Department of Atmospheric Science at NTU. You may not be able to borrow it, but you can view it uh, within the centers. It tells you that the uh, glacier relic features um, on top of the mountains in Taiwan and tells you why we have some fossil elephants and fossil rhinosaurs in Taiwan, especially actually under the sea. And I'll try to introduce you a little bit about um, the major contents of this DVD. First of all, um, let me tell you that uh, Mr. Agassiz was the first one to found uh, the glacier evidence in the high mountains in Switzerland. He was very observant to observe the U-shaped valleys at that place. But when he first proposed uh, this idea, scientists at the time thought he was crazy and no one seemed to pay attention to him. But gradually, people realized he was right. And let me just show you one of his drawings. His earlier drawings, he observed this kind of valley, and he thinks that was a result of ice movement to scour um, the margin of those mountains and to make the U-shape. And also, he found some strange boulders um, irrelevant to the bedrock at all and just isolated on top of the ground there. They call, I think they call this type of boulders erratics or erratics. And he thinks it's very strange. How could, in the beginning, people think someone moved the rock there, but how could it be possible? So. He suggests the glaciers uh, bring these boulders here. And after the glacier melt, 
the block just stays here and becomes very isolated. And also, he observed some uh, sliding features uh, alongside the mountain ridge. Some of them can be as long as several hundred meters. And that could be only expanded by sharp rocks moved by glaciers and then scouring uh, the bad rocks to produce this long strike. And why do we introduce this? Because um, in early days, one of the famous Japanese geologists visit, visited high mountains in Taiwan. He found this kind of stripes in Taiwan. And he also found this kind of strange boulders in Taiwan. He also observed some U-shaped valleys. So he proposed there should have been glaciers in high mountains in early Taiwan. Although at that time, Japanese Geological Society also disagreed with him. But nowadays, we gradually know he was right. Now let's look at um, the ice coverages during glacier times. This is uh, an overshoot from the North Pole. This is a modern day situation, and this is the LGM situation. I mentioned that means uh, uh, extremely cold period at 18,000 years before present. Let's look at nowadays. Mm. The wide areas um, represent land ice. Uh, the gray areas represent sea ice coverage. So nowadays, this is approximately the coverage of the total ice. But at LGM, based on uh, reconstructions, based on those rocks and the moraines, we know uh, the ice coverage was actu actually much, much larger in the past. Almost five times larger than present days. So it's very likely um, it was much colder and uh, higher latitudes in Taiwan has glaciers. Oh, let me just mention one thing. At LGM, when there was so much ice built up on the polar regions, uh, we should have a concept of the con conservation of waters. If we precipitate so much waters on top of the polar regions, it means the sea level would have been dropped, right? Because the total water on Earth is the same. So it means at LGM, the sea level drops. And actually, based on uh, the coral research, uh, at LGM, um, averagely, the sea level have dropped about 120 meters. Let me show you um, again the bathymetric contour of Taiwan, surrounding Taiwan. And um, although now we are separate from mainland China by sea, but actually all these areas are really shallow. If you look at these bars, for color of green, um, most of them are shallower than 200 meters, even 100 meters. So it means when sea level drops for about 100 meters, some of the seafloor would have exposed. And why is that important? Let me show you a reconstruction map, although it's in Mandarin. Here is Taipei, here is Hong Kong, mainland China. And this is our current uh, sea land distribution. This is our current uh, sea land distribution. However, if the sea level dropped for 120 meters. This would be the new borders between continent and the sea. 
it means uh, the Taiwan and mainland China uh, becomes one land. And let's imagine if there are certain animals living here, they should be able to migrate and disperse these areas, right? Now let's look at uh, more details. Here again is a map of Taiwan and mainland China. Here is Taipei, Tainan, and Penghu. And here is a reconstruction as if the sea level have dropped for 70 meters. Even if the sea level only drops for 70 meters, the Taiwan still kind of uh, reached to mainland China. And this did happen in the past for several times um, during glacier interglacial transitions. So actually we have a name for this. We call this Taiwan land bridge. The reason we call that land bridge is because uh, large mammals can really migrate between between these. And then we are going to show you uh, the evidence for that. Here is a reconstruction uh, cartoon for Zhou San Fauna from mainland China. The reason I show this is because uh, for the past years, lots of fishermen, when they, when they were fishing, they always seem to collect some strange bones and some broken bones from the deep seas around these areas. And in the past, they, they didn't know what it is. They just put it in a storage or threw it back to the ocean. However, some scientists from uh, Taiwan National Science Park uh, Museums uh, occasionally saw those bones. They realized that uh, landlocked mammal bones, they could not have been lived under the sea. So they asked the fishermen to collect more or to brought them um, to collect those bones. And they realized those animal bones uh, are so similar to the fauna from mainland China. And actually, they are exactly the same because both Chinese uh, scientists and Taiwanese scientists get together to observe those fossils. They realize they belong to the same fauna. But of course, part of them move into Taiwan. And after the climate move into interglacial period, uh, the land bridge was overflowed by seawater again. So those animals cannot return. And they stay here, become to evolve into very special subspecies. And if you study some uh, biology, you know, if your gene pool is isolated from the major groups, it's very easy to evolve into subspecies. Although you are still able to uh, produce uh, next generation with the main gene pool, but you are separate for so long. So um, your appearance or your behaviors become so different. And these fossils, uh, we call it Hayasakai rhinosaurs, because um, Dr. Hayasakai was uh, um, the Japanese scientist who, um, we should say, he's a Taiwanese geolo geological father because he spends uh, lots of time doing geological survey. And he was the first person who observed glacier relics in Taiwan. And these rhinosaurs, they found it around this area, a very complete one. And they have almost more than 40% of the bones, which means it should be local. And of course, we don't have this kind of rhinosaur right now. Also, in the in the Penghu River, we also found some old elephants and also some mammoths. Although they are 
different from the woolly mammoths from Siberia, but they seem to be related to them, although they, they probably don't have uh, that kind of long wools. But from their teeth and from their tusk, they seem to be related to uh, that kind of species. And the old elephants in Taiwan look exactly the same from those from the southern part of mainland China. So this is the evidence that uh, in the past, at least during um, glacier time, um, Taiwan was connected to mainland China. And why is that important? It's because, let's imagine, why would those animals move southward? It's because um, the weather gets much, much colder, and they may need uh, warmer temperature, or they may need grass, waters, so they move southeast. And it means Taiwan has been uh, a glacier refugee for at least continental animals. And actually, also for those trees, the uh, black forests I show you. Because let's imagine, um, those trees <coughs> were evolved really early in geological time, but Taiwan Island, in terms of tectonic, was relatively new, which means the origin of our trees um, is actually older than the age of Taiwan Island. That sounds impossible, but now the current theory is because during glacier times, those um, um, trees can extend southward to Taiwan, and but when the condition gets warmer, goes into interglacial times, they cannot disperse back quickly in time. So the only niche they can live is to move, move up, to go to higher latitude. That's why at a higher ta latitudes in Taiwan, we have lots of old species in terms of uh, biological evolution. Be we call that glacier refugee species. And the other example is um, uh, the Formosa landlocked salmon. We have a special kind of salmon. The, the, the whole lifetime of these salmon is in fresh water. That's very different from uh, other regular salmon in higher latitudes. The theory is that during glacier times, they can, of course, they can swing no matter in the north or in the south. Some, some of the group move southward into Taiwan areas, but somehow uh, when the climate goes into interglacier, there was some tectonic movement of Taiwan, changed the route of those rivers. So the salmon could not go back to the ocean to grow up they evolve into a life cycle totally in fresh water. Because when uh, they, their ancestor or open ocean salmon, usually they mate in fresh water and they swim back to open ocean to grow up. And then they swim back to um, have the next generation and die in the rivers. So uh, that's uh, also an example, I should say a great example of glacier relic species of Taiwan. And I think I have one last picture of a special uh, bulls of Taiwan. And also, this kind of um, skeletons looks exactly the same from those from mainland China. And we have these kind of exhibitions in, I think it's in Taiwan National Park, and also in the Science National Park in Taichung. And if you guys are interested, you can try to visit that places. Um, okay, I think I'll stop today's lectures, and if you have questions or you need some clarifications from me, then you can ask now.